If, if only more Americans were better informed about international affairs and had a stronger foundation in world history, is something that I suspect most of you have said, not just once, but probably several times. Well, today's guest, Dr. Richard Haas, who's president of the Council of Foreign Relations, is determined to do something about it. And in his latest book, The World, A Brief Introduction, it's certainly a step, an important step in the right direction. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Falk, president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Before we get started, let me remind you that our strategic partner, Interabang Books, Dallas's independent bookstore, offers all of you a 10% discount on the book, The World, as well as any books that you might have in your shopping cart. And to get this 10% discount, just type in the code DFWWORLD. Also want to remind all of you, if by chance you have missed some of our programs, you can always go to our YouTube channel at DFW World. And to keep up with our programs, go to our website at dfwworld.org. I have two programs that I want to really point out, although these are just two of many that are coming up. Uh, just this past Sunday, Farid Zakaria had a really interesting interview with Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. He's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and his new book is Which Country Has the World's Best Health Care? And then on August 12th, I'll be having a conversation with Jeffrey Tubin, CNN legal analyst and, of course, a staff writer at The New Yorker, and he has a book coming out about the Mueller uh, investigation want to be sure to thank our sponsors of today's program, uh, Haynes & Boone, the law firm based here in Dallas. Additional support provided as well by Barry and Nancy Crossman, Astrotech, and our former chairman, as well as a member, Richard, of the Council on Foreign Relations, you know her well, Patricia Patterson. Um, want to uh, also mention that one of the things that I like to do in our conversations is to weave your questions in during uh, our, our talk. So when it pops, when a question pops in your mind, just go ahead and put it in the Q&A box and I will work in as many as I can. And we'll also be doing a lot of questions near the end of the hour as well. Dr. Richard Haas has been uh, president of the Council on Foreign Relations since 2003. The council has had a great reputation for many decades, but I have to say under Richard's stewardship, it truly has become one of the world's preeminent think tanks. Dr. Haas advised President George H.W. Bush as it, when he was a member of the National Security Council from 1989 to 1993. And then he later worked with Secretary of State Colin Powell, where he was director of the State Department's policy planning staff. Uh, Dr. Haas, in two, 2013, served as chair of the multi-party negotiations in Northern Ireland that provided the foundation for the 2014 Stormont House Agreement. And in fact, in 2013, Richard re received the Tipperary, Tipperary International Peace Award. Richard, great to see you. Thanks so much for being with us. Wish you were in Dallas, but uh, this is a way we can reach a lot more people throughout the country. So that's nice as well. Congratulations on your book. Thank you, Jim. Great to be with you. And thank you, thank you for showing that picture of me 30 years ago. <laughs> Couldn't yeah. resist. You know, I, I do want to say before we get started, um, you were kind enough to send me an advanced copy of the book. And, uh, you know, you describe it as a, a, a primer. And for people who are, keep up with international affairs, they may say, well, I don't need to read it. It is a remarkable summary. Uh, I, I love the way you divided the book into different sections. And uh, I remembered a lot from my graduate school days. I'm glad we don't have my picture up there because I had a lot more hair then but also the way you brought in what's happening around the world, and we'll, we'll want to get to that right now. Um, let's begin with a sentence from your book, um, and I think it was on page 63 or so, and you said about U.S. foreign policy, those who maintain that things have never been better are biased by what they are focusing on and underestimate trends that could put existing progress at risk. <laughs> So we're going to pick a fight with Bill Gates, Steven Pinker, and several others from the get-go. Absolutely. There is the, uh, you've never had it so good to echo Harold McMillan's comment back when. Uh, and I think these people are cherry-picking certain uh, data points. For example, the relative uh, fading of war between countries. 
as a major uh, signpost of international relations. That's true. And there are other good things as well. Uh, even though we're in the middle, obviously, of a pandemic, the average duration of life in this country and around the world have gone up dramatically over the last century. Prosperity has gone up. Uh, the prevalence of democracy is going up. This has been a remarkable run of history. So let's, let's I mean, I'm, I'm glad to uh, posit that. The last 75 years have been remarkable. The problem is uh, the prevalence of, of internal conflict. Think of you know, Yemen, Syria, Libya, uh, Venezuela, and other countries. We still do have external conflict, the sort of thing we're seeing in Ukraine. Great power relations are deteriorating at a to a considerable degree at a remarkable rate, particularly between the United States and Russia, United States and China. You've got the proliferation reality of North Korea. Uh, you've got the proliferation possibility of uh, Iran. You've got a cyberspace that's essentially unregulated. You've got climate change that is far, far, far outpacing whatever limited international efforts that are in place to, to con contend with it global health. Uh, you don't need me to give a long lecture on the inadequacy of uh, global health uh, arrangements. Uh, the world trading system in many ways, I think, is, is feeling tremendous pressure. So, you know, what I say to the you've never had it so good club is, yes, things have gotten better, but they've begun to deteriorate. And in many cases, a lot of the arrows are lined up in the, the wrong direction. And one more thing, think about what brought about a lot of these things. And among other things, it was the United States playing this large central role in the world. Well, guess what's happening? The United States, as everybody on this conversation knows, in recent years has dramatically begun to have doubts about the sort of large traditional role it's played in the world. And we're beginning to see the deterioration uh, grow as a result. So we've got to take a step back and take a not a snapshot, but a moving picture of global trends. And I find it hard to be, I, I'll be honest with you, I find it hard to be sanguine. Well, you know, you mentioned Bob Gates a minute ago, and as you know, he has his new book, Exercise of Power. Actually, I mentioned, just to be clear, I mentioned Bill Gates. Bob Gates oh, okay, right. but, Bob probably uh, agrees with me more than... And, 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 he do, and that's what I wanted to mention about the Department of State, where you've, of course, had so much experience. Um, Bob Gates talks about the need to really reform the Department of State. And yet it's been so difficult for people to do that. I mean, so many secretaries of state and others in positions like yours have attempted to do so. Why is it so hard? What are the reforms that are needed? And, and are they achievable? Look, all bureaucracies are hard to reform. Uh, you've got cultural issues, you've got organizational uh, issues. In the case of the State Department, you've got to think about it in different time spans. There's a long-term challenge, which is to get the best and the brightest to decide to work there, to become foreign service officers. And that means making it interesting, exciting. Uh, I think we've got to stop disparaging career civil servants. Uh, on my short list of phrases, I really dislike Jim, is deep state. These are career professionals. These are people who are choosing public service. And the last I checked, you don't get stock options when you work for the State Department. This is a form of public service and they ought to be thanked for it and respected for it rather than denigrated. But more immediately, you've got to make high quality appointments. You've got to fill spaces. And then you've got to listen to people. You've got to set up an interagency process where uh, expertise is, is respected. So again, some things are long-term again, filling the ranks with talent. That's a generational challenge. But some things are more immediate, and I could see a new administration, or this one that has the options, of a lateral entry. We don't have to think as careers. So I've worked in the State, State Department many times coming in from the, uh, uh, the outside. I'd like to bring back some of the people who have left. I think it would be great to bring back. We, we lost too much talent way too quickly. Uh, a whole generation of seasoned foreign policy veterans were made to feel uncomfortable or were simply not uh, listened to. I would love to see uh, the President of the United States uh, commit to appointing qualified people as ambassadors. Don't have to just be Foreign Service officers. We've had some sensational non-Foreign Service officers as ambassadors. But let's have quality people who get the job because they're really positioned to serve the country rather than awards for campaign uh, contributions. But the big thing is when you make foreign policy, right now we've got, a, I think, an overly ad hoc approach 
where White House staff operating outside the National Security Council mechanism have way too much influence. It's way too, again, unsystematic. Uh, if we once again empower the National Security Council, working with the State Department, the Defense Department, the intelligence community, and Treasury Department, what have you, then I think talented people will say, okay, these are really important issues. I can make a difference. I am prepared to come back and serve my country. You know, one of the things that I didn't realize, and you've talked about how so many senior people left the Department of State in the last three or four years, but also um, a lot of uh, members of minorities, uh, Blacks and Hispanics, and the fact that only, what, now there's three Black U.S. ambassadors and no women, no Black women serving as ambassadors, really a, a pretty depressing statistic. Um, no, what needs to be done to bring people back in? Well, again, there's, there's a talented pool of people to choose from, women, uh, people of color, so that, that, that could be to some extent addressed in short order. I think the bigger challenge, which will take time, is to create a, is to get the best and the brightest among various communities, whether it's women, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, and others, to choose this career. One thing we're trying to do at the Council on Foreign Relations is create a much more of a pipeline. We're spending time talking to the historically black colleges. We're doing an annual diversity conference. We just got all of our internships paid for. So as a result, they're now available to all sorts of people regardless of needs. And it's really opened up uh, the, the internship program at the council, uh, other fellowships. What we're trying to do is make it clear that careers in the international space, by the way, it doesn't just have to be the, you know, the State Department, it could be the intelligence community, the military, it doesn't have to be the government. It could be as a journalist, a business person, go work for Doctors Without Borders or the International Rescue Committee. There's so many ways to have a fulfilling and constructive uh, career, in, or not even just a career, a stint. You know, a young person doesn't have to sit there and say, oh, I don't know if I'm prepared to make a, a lifetime commitment. No one needs to. You can make a, a few year commitment. Um, and I think, uh, so what we're trying to do is create a greater pipeline, a greater pool of talent that really represents and, and looks like uh, America. I've made that a, a big personal commitment of mine. You know, one of our viewers had just said, why is it that we now, and I, I think it gets back a little bit to how expertise is frowned upon, but what our viewer says, is, why is it that we never revere international knowledge as a qualification for our presidential candidates? For instance, it was never mentioned, I, I think it was mentioned, and probably not in a good way, that John Kerry was fluent in, in French when he was running for office, and that was actually used against him at times. Uh, and the week of Bastille Day, it seems most unfortunate. Uh, look, um, it's interesting. You know, we've had a painful, painful lesson in the last six months of just how influential the world is on us. What began in Wuhan didn't stay on Wuhan. 9-11 uh, was a painful example. 3,000 people lost their lives in a day because of what came out of Afghanistan. Climate change is a slow motion painful lesson that what happens everywhere and anywhere has a cumulative uh, impact. So the world matters. So you would hope and think that these issues would be on the forefront of people's minds when they go to the polls. Plus, whoever we elect as president, he or she, this year it will be a he, has tremendous latitude, tremendous discretion when it comes to making foreign policy. Constitution has very little to say but traditionally, almost all of the initiative lies with the executive. Congress has a, a subordinate role at uh, most. So this is a really consequential dimension of who we vote for. And so I'm struck, say, during the Democratic debates, I lost count how many there were, but I bet if you did an analysis of the content, less than 10% of those debates was devoted to the sorts of subjects we're talking about here for an hour uh, today. One of the reasons I wrote this book is I want people to push these issues into the public space. I want people to ask this question of a candidate before they send them a check or, 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 or vote for them. After they're elected, I want people to hold elected officials, whether it's presidents or senators or congressmen, uh, to account. You know, Jefferson's insight, sorry he couldn't be here with us today, but Jefferson said that one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, makes for a democracy 
and sustains a democracy is an informed citizenry. And the problem is our citizenry is not informed about the world, even though the world is that important to them. But you graduate from virtually any college or university in this country without having taken a single course about the world. Courses are offered, they're not required at most schools. Most school, high schools don't even offer them. A lot of people obviously don't go to uh, college. You could watch the evening news most nights and in the whatever it is, 22 or 23 minutes of quote unquote news that we show, there's often not a single story about the, uh, about the world. And my point is simply that uh, I'm struck by the disconnect between the objective importance of the world on the United States, the objective influence of the United States on the world, and the lack of familiarity and knowledge and understanding that most American citizens have. And you know, again, uh, well, well, tell our viewers how you opened the book with the, talking to um, a student from, I believe it was Stanford. Uh, yeah, I'm glad it wasn't uh, the University of Texas or A&M. Or want University to. of Virginia, I might add. Or <laughs> University of Virginia or, or uh, a school in Dallas, uh, SMU or something. This case was Stanford. We were fishing and he was a computer sciences major going into a senior and I was curious. I don't know a lot about computer science, so I, I couldn't sustain a conversation on that. But I was, in, I was interested in what a Stanford computer science major would study outside of his field. And I asked him, well, how many courses have you had on history and international relations and economics? And basically the answer was none. And what Stanford does, like most schools, is basically says you have to, in order to graduate, you have to, for example, take two courses out of the, out of the 126 courses that would fulfill your social science requirement or whatever it happens to be. And you have this enormous scope so you can choose some truly, uh, I won't say unimportant, but sideshow, whatever, I'm probably using the wrong word here, but you, you, but you can avoid getting anything like a classic foundational understanding of either world. Same thing, by the way, holds for American civics of American democracy. And that's what, you know, I've, and, when I'm, and when I looked into it, his experience wasn't unique. Same holds for other elite and most other non-elite uh, institutions around the uh, country, and it doesn't just affect students. So again, yeah, I was, what led me to do this is mostly this, this gap between the importance of the world, the importance of the United States to the world, and how little most Americans and others uh, knew about it. And adding to it, and you'll remember this, what, co what books there are, introductory books about international relations, have you ever looked at one? It's as if they were written for the most part to discourage anybody from finishing that book, much less reading another. Extremely heavy on theory, extreme in ways that I have never had a conversation. Yeah, I've worked for four presidents. I've been really lucky. I've worked at defense. I've worked and stayed at the White House. I haven't had, walked into a room and had someone say, Richard, would you please give me a constructivist or neoliberal take on this and uh, as opposed to a realist or what? I, I mean, it's not the way the world works. And it's, and I'm not saying those categories are not to some extent important theory has its place, but that's fine if you want to specialize in the field as an academic. But if you're a citizen and you need a grounding in the field, that's not the way to go. Let's talk about how on colleges, uh, on university campuses right now, they're going to look so different next <clears throat> year or this, this fall. In one area, and we don't really know how this is going to evolve because President Trump walked back on it this week, but is the change with the uh, demographics of international students. Uh, one, whether or not they even will be able to come, and two, whether they want to come because there's been such a significant drop in competition from Australia, the UK, and in particular China. Yeah, I think we face, you know, the immigration policies to me are stunningly short-sighted in this country. Uh, immigration on balance has been, from my point of view, an enormous boon to this country. If you look at the Fortune 100 or 200, an awful lot of the people running these companies are either immigrants or descendants, recent descendants or descendants of recent uh, immigrants. A lot of these students, we want to have them come here and stay here. Tremendous pool of talent for this country to, to have. If I were gonna make a list of the things that makes America competitive, that'd be on my short list. Our ability to attract and keep some of the most talented young minds from, uh, from around the world. And even if we don't keep them, I love the fact that these young people have been exposed to the United States, created friendships, 
hopefully see aspects of this economy, this society, this political system makes attractive, and they go home. And they're different people. And they're in a position to press for certain kinds of change around the, uh, around the world. I, I love all that. Yeah. So I, I think it's just a major mistake through our immigration system or what was gonna be this new regulation to discourage it. It also puts a lot of colleges and universities obviously in a financial bind. Mm -hmm. I think it's worse off for American students. I think it's healthy for them that they interact with students from overseas. This, this ought to be part of their, their education. Uh, again, not everyone's gonna travel all over the world. Not everyone's gonna be an international relations graduate. But I want every flute major or engineering major or anything major to have some interaction with people from other cultures and backgrounds, whether it's socially or in a classroom. So I just think it's a, a big mistake for a, a dozen different reasons to create a, an unwelcoming environment here in the United States for, for overseas students. And you're touching on this. Let, let me ask you to elaborate because we have a question from Paul Pass. And he says, what role can project-based learning play in integrating high-demand STEM subjects in real-world applications and global issues? What role can project-based learning play? Say that again, I'm sorry. What project can project-based learning play? Uh, I guess what he's really, you know, saying, you know, what integration do you do between STEM students and, and global, I mean, uh, liberal arts? Yeah, well, the answer is, as my computer sciences Stanford young man represents, I want a degree of global literacy and civics literacy in my STEM students. And I want a degree of STEM literacy in my liberal arts students. Uh, I think everybody, I, I think one of the interesting conversations we need to have a hell of a lot more of in this country at the high school and college level is what do we consider, what do we want every young person to have under his or her belt? be it uh, to be competent, to be functioning in a society, to fulfill citizenship, to fulfill their own potential. And I don't think we have a nearly enough of a conversation about what is a, what's an educated person? What is the foundational education we now have? What can you best learn on a campus, say, in, as opposed to on the job? And we ought to have this, and why, aren't, why wouldn't there be national standards on certain aspects of the world or the country? I would think, the idea that Texas would be different from California, from Massachusetts, on what it means to be an American, that bothers me. That almost is antithetical to the whole idea, or that, you know, there's, there's a single world out there in terms of realities. So, you know, there's China, okay. Well, I, I wouldn't want people in Texas to have a different understanding of China than people in, in Arkansas. Seems to me we ought to want people. So I think, you know, Right now, there's a lot of talk about higher education for all the reasons you're talking about. The whole business model's being thrown up in the air. Remote education, who's gonna pay money not to be in a classroom? Can you safely be in a classroom? I get all that. I hope a little bit of time is put aside, Jim, for thinking about what, is, what now do we want an education to be at this stage of a person's life? Because also, we've now gotta also rethink or reimagine education. It's not just something that happens to young people. It's also something now that happens over the next 50 years of their lives. People are going to have to get reskilled. They're going to have to get retrained. The world's going to change. Look at me. All of my education on international relations was done halfway through the Cold War. So in some ways, uh, over the last 30 years, I've gotten you know, retooled to deal with a lot of the issues. I think we've got to rethink education as a lifelong thing. And coming back to the question, uh, I, I, we need a national conversation, and every institution, by the way. I would say every institution needs its own conversation among students, faculty, alumni, uh, administrators, about what do we want this degree to stand for? What do I want every employer who sees someone, say, go, who went to SMU, what do we want them to be able to assume about that young man or woman? That they can take for granted that that's, this is what that person uh, knows and has been exposed to. I think that's, an, that's a conversation every institution has to have. Every institution should and will come out in a different place, and that's great. I'm not arguing for homogeneity. I think there ought to be certain basic standards. I like the idea that different institutions come out in different places, but institutions, I think, should not be afraid to say, we are going to demand that every person who graduates from here has had this 
leaves the campus with this, with this exposure. And you know, it's not just at the university level. As you know, Richard, our World Affairs Council in Dallas has over 70 chapters on high school campuses, and, and we're not unique in the World Affairs Council system. I mean, there are literally dozens of World Affairs Councils that are working with high school students, and we have received uh, numerous uh, unsolicited letters from universities saying so-and-so got a scholarship or was admitted to this university. <clears throat> what stood out was their involvement with the World Affairs Council, and you know, you, you, you can't start too early. You can't start too, uh, too early. Uh, Dr. Seuss even has some things to say about all this. Well, I see that we have a, a, a lot of questions about the, the presidential election, but before we get there, I wanna ask you uh, uh, to talk a bit about China. Bill Burns, who you know well, one of our nation's leading uh, retired diplomats now, perhaps one of the people you were talking about, who's now president of the uh, Carnegie Endowment, just has a piece <clears throat> in The Atlantic. And I'll quote from it. Preventing China's rise is beyond America's capacity and our economies are too entangled to decouple. So what Bill Burns calls for is a wor working directly and engaging with China's leadership, which is certainly every day now we're seeing in the papers, a new tit and for tat. Um, how do you see our relationship with China and is Bill Burns right? Look, our relationship is uh, bad and getting worse. And this is a potential lose-lose situation, be bad for the United States, it'd be bad for China. Now, this is the defining international relationship of this era of history. And if the, situ if the relationship becomes a cold war, if it even worse than that becomes a hot war, tremendous direct and indirect cost. Uh, I'm a realist, I don't expect the relationship to become close. The real challenge is can you carve out selected areas of limited cooperation against a backdrop or in a context where obviously you disagree and compete. I want to be able to cooperate to some extent with China, say, on global health or on climate change or on dealing with uh, North Korean missiles and nuclear weapons or on dealing with uh, Afghanistan since China borders on it. So that's my goal. My, it's, 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 and it's an ambitious but not crazy goal for diplomats that again, we would find areas of limited cooperation and try to insulate them in some ways, given the fact that uh, we're gonna have to, we're gonna inevitably disagree and push back. It's not an all or nothing economic relation. I don't like the word decoupling. It's not, we're either totally coupled or totally decoupled. We're gonna have to find some areas of uh, selectiveness there as well. It might be certain technologies we decide that we can't be dependent on China, such as uh, 5G. To me, the most important thing of all of this is we don't, we shouldn't be doing this alone. The first thing that we need to do is approach China, not individually, but with our alliances, our alliances in Europe, and even more our alliances in, in Asia and our partnerships in Asia. I think one of the biggest strategic mistakes the United States has made in recent years is not joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's bad for our agricultural and manufacturing exporters, but also, this, this would have been, what, 40% or so of the world's economy had we joined. And if, if we had gone together and told China, you want to ex export to us, here's the standards you have to meet. Now, that would be a trade deal. Incomparably more important than negotiating this amount of soybean exports to, to China. That is not a serious undertaking. TPP, or now its successor agreement, that holds out the possibility of, of being uh, a, a serious economic, but also strategic mechanism for, for dealing with China. But Bill's essentially right. We, the goal shouldn't be to prevent China's rise. That's a feckless and ill-advised uh, effort. China's gonna rise or not rise, by the way, and its rise is not inexorable, based upon its own, its own policies. China's gonna be hurt dramatically by the demographic consequences of the one-child policy. It's gonna be hurt, I would argue, by its consolidation of power, which doesn't allow a change in, and questioning to happen very easily. It's gonna, have to, it's gonna be hurt by its environmental degradation. It's gonna be hurt by its repression of various minorities. So I don't think China is, is 10 feet tall. We should worry less about China's rise than our own. You know, the best China, let me give you an idea that maybe people here haven't heard of. How about America first? Why don't we do something about spending more money on basic research? 
Why don't we improve the quality of American infrastructure? Why don't we improve the quality of America's elementary schools? The one experience every American has is he or she goes to a school from what, the ages of six or seven through 16. Why don't we invest more and make those better? Uh, why don't we have an immigration system which encourages the best and brightest to come in and stay here? We can, we can more than hold our own against China. We, we shouldn't bother with trying to block China so much as promote ourselves. Let me ask you this, though. One of our viewers, Steve Cotton, who works in the financial area, says, um, when China pursues predatory economic, political, and technology espionage practices and actively seeks to replace the U.S. dollar as the international currency, how do we handle that? How do we propose to deal with the fact that you know, they are really now competing with us in the financial markets? Well, look, in, in, the, in the dollar, China does not have a fully convertible currency. The, the biggest threat to the dollar is American financial mismanagement. If we want the dollar to remain the world's, world, world's reserve currency, which we should, it confers many advantages on us. Uh, well, let's think about how do we get our debt and deficit under control. Let's not compromise the political independence of the Federal Reserve. Uh, let's show some competence in how we deal with, whether it's dealing with pandemics or other domestic challenges. Let's show some sensitivity to the economic needs and concerns of others. If we act as a responsible steward of the world's reserve currency, no one's going to want to change that. Let's also hold back a little bit on some of our unilateral tariffs and financial sanctions. Let's not weaponize the dollar. Let's think bigger and larger. So at the moment, the biggest threat, I think, to the continued primacy of the dollar is American uh, financial management or, or mismanagement. It's not about China. That's about, that's about uh, us. What is about China? Yes, uh, things like uh, intellectual property espionage. We ought to make it harder. We ought to think about sanctions where, uh, where appropriate. My own view is also over time, China might become a little bit more responsible in this area, not because they've suddenly become wonderful, but they're producing more and more patents. They're increasingly on the production end and not just on the taking end. And it's conceivable that they'll become more conservative in this area when they feel they've got a, a bigger stake. And I, I don't, we're not there yet, but I don't think that's a, a naive or unrealistic possibility. How much has China suffered? Uh, as, let's break that into two questions. How much has China and the United States suffered from their handling of COVID-19? You're exactly right. I think both countries have lost altitude. This is not a zero sum where one's loss is the other gains. One's loss is, is matched by the other's loss. China, by its initial lack of transparency, lack of honesty, it didn't meet its, its obligations under the international health. Uh, regulation. So the, the first month in particular, what China did was was irresponsible uh, against, by the way, her Chinese as well as the rest of the world. The, then the World Health Organization did not cover itself with glory. So we, you know, we can blame China to some extent uh, for the fact that the, the pandemic, the virus rather, uh, reached here. But we can't blame China for the fact that we only shut down travel of Chinese to the United States early on, not all Americans who had been to China. More important, we can't blame China for the fact that we still, six months into the crisis, do not have effective testing. We can't blame China for the lack of PPE or ventilators uh, or the fact that people are not wearing masks. So, you know, as the expression goes, relevant here, physician, heal thyself. So yes, China can be held accountable for what happened at the outset. But increasingly, the reality of COVID-19 in the United States, the 135,000 or so deaths, the several million cases, that's on us. That's on the president, it's on the administration, it's on governors, it's on, it's on mayors, it's on many individual uh, Americans. So again, it's not a useful conversation, I think, to stop, just to keep blaming China, particularly since this is not just a, of historical curiosity. What we do today, what we do this afternoon, what we do tomorrow will affect the lives and will f affect the trajectory of the American economy. So no amount of China bashing at this point is gonna get us to where we wanna be in, in, in over the next coming couple of months. You know, an issue that's certainly gonna be impacted by the virus is migration. And I think it just sort of tipped it over because one of the things you mentioned in the book is how extreme poverty <clears throat> has declined 
by one third in, in, in the last three decades and now only 8% of the world's population. But that's certainly gonna change now. Some people have speculated uh, that world hunger is gonna double or is doubling right now. What's the impact on migration, do you think? I'm worried that, uh, you know, we've already live in a world where what, roughly one out of every 100 people around the world, probably 80 or so million people out of nearly 8 billion is either, quote, internally displaced, essentially a forced migrant within their own borders or they're a refugee, they're forced to cross borders. Um, distinguishing between people who migrate for self-migrate out of economic incentives from want of a better, or political incentives for want of a better life or job. But the amount of forced migrants is now about 1% of the world. My hunch is it's gonna go up. Uh, it's gonna go up because of uh, instability, failed, weak and failed countries, the Yemens, the Syrias, the Libyas, the Venezuelas, and others. Uh, climate change is going to make more and more land uninhabitable. Won't be uh, enough water or places to, to plant crops. Again, growing political instability out of, out of the pandemic and prolonged economic dislocation. And all this is going to happen at a time where already the doors were largely closed to, my, to migration. And I think fears about disease are going to not just close doors, but, but, but lock them. So I think this could be the humanitarian aspects of this could be could be really could be really grim, but also it will have elements of uh, it will drive greater degrees of destabilization, uh, particularly in parts of the Middle East, uh, partly parts of Africa, conceivably also parts of the Americas. And I, I would assume you would say that underscores the importance for the United States to not withdraw from international organizations. Look, uh, you know, anytime you face a situation where you got it, you're in something or you could go into something and it, it's imperfect, I get that. There's no organization that's perfect. But the question shouldn't be, we're gonna withdraw because it's imperfect. The question is, should be, what's better than what we have? Is, it, uh, is, it, uh, is there a way to reform the organization? Can we create a new one? Because by and large, withdrawal is a gesture. And I, I don't, I'm not big uh, about, my enthusiasm for foreign policy by gesture is really uh, limited. So this pattern though of serial withdrawal of, from all these organizations and, and virtually every case has left us more isolated, less influential, less uh, well off, we're not any less vulnerable to this or that globally. You know, just because we withdraw from Paris doesn't mean we're less vulnerable to climate change. Just because we don't join the International uh, Compact on Migration doesn't save us from that. The fact that we're not going to be in the World Health Organization is not going to increase our uh, protected, uh, protectiveness against disease. So all it's going to do is mute our, our, mute our influence in, in many cases. And, and in no case do I see that we put something better in this place. Again, I'm not, a, I'm not locked into anything if I thought there was a preferable, viable, available uh, alternative. So I would say, you know, that's where foreign policy comes in. You don't like the World Health Organization? I get it. So then talk to other members who are like-minded, the Europeans, the Japanese, South Koreans, Australia, and say, can we improve this? If not, can we supplement it with something else? That's, by the way, what we did with HIV AIDS. The World Health Organization was clearly not up to the task for various reasons. Okay, we then work with others, and the others, by the way, can be countries, they can be foundations, the Gates Foundation. Uh, it could be companies, drug companies, uh, to come up with something that either takes its place or supplements it and hopefully fills in behind its uh, weaknesses. Whatever we do, though, again, simply withdrawal is not a, a policy. I don't think we were talking about at the beginning. Um, unilateralism is not a preferable approach. And so it seems to me what we've done is we've locked ourselves into this pattern of isolationism and unilateralism. When the, what we really want to have, we want to be involved and we want to bring others with us. So this is a good time to bring in Rob Walters in the conversation and he asks this question. How do we prevail on our citizens who are fearful of the world to embrace the world and not shrink from it as a better path to prosperity and opportunity and I would add, you know, how do we have people not feel, feel that we're going to lose our sovereignty by being involved in the world? Look, it's a legitimate question. And again, 
Part of it is a ground up approach. That's we're teaching these issues in the schools. It's you know, the reason I wrote this book is I want to have a different, more informed conversation to explain, uh, not that the world doesn't bring with it risks, but that withdrawal is not an option. Isolation is not an option. There are things we can and should do that'll protect our basic, uh, our basic uh, interests. I think presidents and other leaders can make a difference. Um, you know, the Oval Office is a great classroom. FDR showed it with his fireside chats. Reagan showed it. Kennedy showed it. I think we can explain things to the American people in ways that they will uh, respond to. Business leaders, uh, civil society leaders can make the case to their employees and others uh, in the case of business about the relationship between here we are, we're a plant, we export this or that uh, item, and here's why global trading arrangements can be can be very much in our in our interest. I think it has to be worked from from uh, from every level. And look, there's going to be a, a healthy public debate, but I think we got a teaching opportunity now, Jim. What we've seen is that we are vulnerable to what, in this case, came out of an obscure city in China. And what I would like to see is that rather than just China bashing or World Health Organization bashing. This leads to something of a serious conversation about how do we prepare for COVID-22 a couple of years down the road, or for some bacteria that might be uh, emerged that's resistant to antibiotics, or how do we prepare or contend with other global uh, challenges? That's the conversation we need to, you know, to be having. And I, I don't think it's I don't think it's beyond us. At, at other points in our history we have had big conversations about our involvement with the world. Look at what happened after World War II. The natural tendency after winning the war was to turn inward again, which is exactly what happened after World War I. But we didn't do it after World War II. So it's, I take from that a little bit of something positive that it shows what real leadership, you know, FDR followed by Truman and then others it became bipartisan, uh, that can bring Americans along in the world. And by the way, just saying, uh, we can afford it. It's not only that we have to be involved in the world because it's in our interest. Good news is we can do everything we need to do at home and still do what we should be doing in the world. You know, the amount we're now spending on our foreign and defense policy is only about half, slightly more than half the average we spent during the Cold War. So you know, we can do what we need to do in the world. We can afford it. Uh, to use the old expression, we can have guns and butter. We can have a large global role and do what we need to do. And in many cases, our problems here at home are not because of how much we spend, they're really because of how we spend. And if we spend smarter here at home, we can certainly uh, have more for, for, for less. That's true, but it's also how do people get information? And I'm gonna combine a question from Ann and Bob who talk about one, where do you get, where does one get credible information about current international affairs and then Bob says the same thing. What about consistent truth, insightful daily news? Great question. I actually have a chapter in the book at the end called Where to Go for More, something that I, 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 I think about. Look, there's a, a number of quality newspapers in this country, and even if you don't like the editorial page, the news part is just fine. The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post. Uh, I like the Financial Times. I'll admit I read the New York Post, but that's mainly for sports and for gossip. That's, uh, that's something uh, else. I think um, weekly, like The Economist, I think is a really good, concise uh, read. Uh, I think uh, Foreign Affairs, our magazine, the one the Council on Foreign Relations publishes, is the best journal devoted to international issues. But every day we have fresh content on the website. Also, our website, CFR.org, I'll brag for a second. We curate, it's not just our own stuff, we curate. It's the best, we put on there the best stuff we can find, analysis, wide range of views, quality about foreign policy and international uh, relations. A show like Fareed Zakaria's on uh, CNN is a good show. Every week, PBS, NPR, you've got a really good NPR station in your city. Um, so there, there's places to, and even on the internet, there's, there's, there's what's, the internet's both wonderful and frustrating because there's wonderful things on it, great sources of information. And then there's just a lot of stuff that's totally wrong, biased, conspiratorial, unchecked. Sometimes it's hard to know. So one of the things I always tell people is um, expose yourself to lots of stuff. Don't, don't, 
just watch one cable channel or just go to one internet site. Expose yourself to, to a range of things. And that way, I think there's a little bit of protection that, 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 comes from, that, that comes from that. And Richard, you only left out one thing, probably the most important, that is to support your local World Affairs Council. I was getting to that. I'm and sure you were. So uh, 75 years ago, 75 years ago, the first atomic bomb test was launched at Trinity in New Mexico. Um, two years ago, President Trump stood next to uh, President Putin at Helsinki, at the Helsinki summit. Where do we stand right now on nuclear disarmament? Um, and I'd like to ask you just to elaborate in the time that we have remaining uh, about both North Korea and Iran. Um, are, are the strategies different? There are, there are. Uh, in terms of the United States and Russia, one of the first decisions the new president will have to make, whether it's Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden, will be in February because the, the principal strategic nuclear arms control pact between the United States and Russia is due to expire. There is no time to renegotiate its terms. Uh, what I'm hoping is it's simply extended and then a negotiation can start about possibly including other systems that have come along about other parties such as China. But it's important this get extended. I would think the plate is plenty full. In, in the world and between the United States and Russia without adding a new dimension of nuclear uh, competition there. So that's one thing that we could usefully do, not to solve the problem, but at least to put something of a, a lid on it. The two horizontal proliferation challenges of North Korea and Iran are, are obviously paramount. Very different. North Korea obviously has quite a number of nuclear weapons as well as delivery systems. Uh, we can talk about denuclearization until the cows come home. It's not going to happen anytime soon, if ever. I don't mind keeping it as a goal, but we can't make it our, our only approach to policy. And I think what we need to do with North Korea is try to structure, I'm not, I'm not sure it's possible, a negotiation with them where essentially they would, in exchange for certain reductions in their nuclear and missile capability that are verified, they would receive certain uh, economic benefits, certain relief from sanctions. That seems to me the basics of the approach. I understand we've tried things like that, it hasn't worked. The question is now whether North Korea uh, feels pressured to make it work and I wouldn't rule it out. And I would also make this a priority in the US-China relationship. It's one of the reasons that I think it's important we keep open a relationship with China. Iran's a different case. We don't, uh, Iran does not have nuclear weapons, but they're beginning to move out beyond the confines of the 2015 uh, so-called JCPOA, the nuclear accord. That, what that does is reduce the warning time we would have if they ever did want to produce nuclear uh, weapons. I think that would be uh, unacceptable if they ever got close to them or, or actually had them. Not only the question is what might they do against that backdrop, but think about what the Saudis or what the Turks or the Egyptians might uh, do. I mean, for those of you who think the Middle East can't get worse, well, that's a scenario where it would get a lot worse uh, Real, real fast. So we obviously want to prevent that from happening. The problem is in this conversation about should we rejoin the 2015 agreement? You know, I didn't love the agreement. I thought it had uh, certain flaws. I didn't support though leaving it unilaterally when we did. Now though, to simply go back into it only buys you a couple of years. Uh, already the conventional military arms parts of it are expiring and the nuclear, uh, four years after the new president gets in, the nuclear parts will begin to expire. We need a longer term agreement. We do not want Iran to have an entire nuclear inventory uh, and all the prerequisites of dozens of weapons in a number of years. We don't want that to happen ever. So I think we need a follow on agreement. And that's something the United States, I believe, initially should put together with its European partners, see if we can get the Chinese and Russians to support it. If we can, great. If not, we work without them. And we go to Iran and say, here's the deal, almost like North Korea. This, you know, here's what you've got to sign on to in exchange for this degree, these, uh, you know, and then you'll get this degree of sanctions, uh, sanctions relief. So uh, in, in both cases, I would have what I call something for something. Uh, in the case of North Korea, I don't think we can just demand everything. And in the case of Iran, I think our policy is essentially not to negotiate, it's to bring about regime change. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the farm on that coming about. So it won't surprise you that we have <laughs> several questions about what might happen in the presidential election. Uh, from Don, if President Trump has a second term, 
what do you anticipate his foreign policy priorities to be? And then clearly on the other side questions, what might be the steps that um, a, a, a President Biden might take to um, reassert or bring America, the United States back into um, a global community of nations? Yeah, well, if, Trump, if President Trump is reelected, um, he hasn't given many hints about what he would do. And he was asked that question a few weeks ago about, I think it was by Sean Hannity, about a second term. Uh, you couldn't derive or discern anything in his answer. It was as if he hadn't thought it uh, through. So I'm working from the assumption, absent any language to the contrary, that you would have more of the same in a second Trump term. That's, you know, I, I have no grounds for thinking otherwise. By and large, people who get reelected uh, see it as a mandate. And my guess is, and it's not as though he's running to do something fundamentally on foreign policy that's different than what he's done. So I assume he would continue to be as unilateral as he is. I assume that he would have no more love for allies. I assume um, he would have uh, his own, shall we say, unique approach to, to trade agreements. Uh, would have uh, would not suddenly discover a new uh, interest in global and climate change or multilateral institutions. Basically, I think you would have more of the same. Uh, so, if you like his foreign policy, great. If you, if you don't, then it's grounds for real concern. I think a President Biden would offer something up quite different. I think it would be much more alliance based. I think his first instinct would be to restore or try to revive. America's relations with its European and Asian uh, partners. I would expect he would go into lots of international institutions that the United States has uh, exited from. Well, let me just make a couple of points. Will they be receptive? Oh, yes. I think uh, for the most part, yes. Uh, I think the Europeans and some of the others would, Asians would be relieved, not just uh, receptive. But let me make a few points. One is on trade. There's strong voices in the Democratic Party that are not dissimilar from some of Mr. Trump's concerns. Uh, if you remember, you know, Democratic candidates tended not to support TPP, uh, cooled on NAFTA. So I think on trade, not clear what uh, the trade agenda would uh, be. Also concerns about military force, not things like Germany. I think the Germany decision would be reversed, but things like in the Middle East, be interesting to see what happens in uh, places like Syria and, uh, and uh, Afghanistan. The bigger question, though, it seems to me, is what do we do beyond that? And by that, I mean, if one of the real challenges, this challenge, one of them, China, I actually think a Biden policy, again, it's always dangerous, as Yogi Berra said, to make predictions about the future. But I would think a, a Biden-China policy would be pretty robust. Uh, it would be very tough on human rights, very tough on things like the South China Sea, probably very tough on technology. So, I think it's a difficult era of U.S.-Chinese relations, regardless of what happens this November. Let me just say that. I don't think the Biden team would be nearly as focused on a, 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 a trade agreement that simply guaranteed certain levels of American manufacturing or agricultural uh, exports. I think the real question is what a Biden team, though, would do about regional and global arrangements. I mentioned Iran. I mentioned North Korea. What about climate change? The issue is not whether you go into Paris. Paris is woefully inadequate. What do you do about climate change? There is nothing to go into when it comes to regulating cyberspace. It's essentially unregulated. What do you do about that? It's not good enough to just get back in the WHO. What do you do about global health? That gets interesting. And that's what we haven't heard about yet. What would be the creative agenda to deal with regional and global challenges? And I think that's a, that would be the, the big issue. Uh, the good news is that I think there would be an instinct to work in these questions. And again, if we do it with allies, then it gives us a lot more leverage. We have an interesting question from Don Llewellyn. Is there a country, Richard, we should use in an example of citizens with a higher level of world awareness? When I used to uh, teach at an institution on the East Coast and uh, not that far from Boston, it was an institution, I should add, that rejected me when I was applying as a student, but let me in the back door as a faculty <laughs> Uh, I was struck by how much more the overseas students knew than the American students, both about the world and about United States political history. The latter in particular was quite stunning. 
uh, by and large, students going to the, you know, the best institutions in places like Germany, uh, Britain, uh, and, you know, Australia know more, much more about the world than some of the Scandinavian schools than, than do the uh, United States. And I think part of the reason, in a funny sort of way, is because we're so big and we're so influential and so, so powerful, a lot of Americans haven't bothered in some ways to learn about the world. Whereas a lot of others who are so much smaller and so much more aware of how the world affects their well-being and their futures uh, have necessarily learned more about the world. You know, and also, you know, we constitute what? 20, 25% of the world's economy. Well, if you only constitute 1% of the world's economy, obviously you're gonna have to think differently about your economic relationships with the rest of the world. So again, I find a lot of places, particularly in Europe, some in Asia, are, are far more, uh, far better informed about the world than we are. You have a, a section, or it's almost, perhaps it's a chapter in the book, about international society and how we need to move beyond international systems to international society. We have about another minute or two. Comment on that. <laughs> yeah, a, a society is more than a system. A, a society represents there's rules, there's norms, there's often institutions to back up. A system is just what is, what kind of happens. A society is more than that. And it's, it, what it takes is the leading countries of their time to set up an order based upon certain principles, certain rules, often certain uh, institutions, sometimes penalties for, for breaking them. And that's, that's, that's the mark of, a, of international relations at a high uh, level. Uh, that ought to be our goal. And I think the challenge for the, for the future is how do we do just that? And it's got to be more than simply, you mentioned sovereignty for, yes, we got to respect sovereignty. We don't want countries invading with one another. We don't want countries interfering in one another's politics. But also, we need to now understand that what happens inside the borders of any country can have tremendous implications for another, whether it's terrorists operating, disease breaking out, destroying a rainforest. So what we need is a world where sovereignty is respected. At the same time, sovereignty is not absolute and unconditional. And that ought to be the element of an international society. That is where we need to go, but we are not even close to being there yet. And I suspect that many of your uh, talks like this end with this question from Pete. What do you consider the most important international issue facing the United States that isn't getting the attention that it should? Uh, the single most is the United States and its relationship with the world. Uh, we have been instrumental in shaping history for the last 75 years. And the single biggest question is what are we going to do and how are we going to do it in all these questions of multilateralism versus unilateralism of, of involvement versus isolation. If you ask me what's the biggest variable that will shape the next era of history, as big as China is, as big as climate change is, as big as disease is, the single biggest variable I know is the relationship of the United States with the world. Well, Richard, thanks so much. It sounds like your lunch is getting prepared. And I uh, want to remind everybody that they can go to interrobangbooks.com to get 10% off the book today. Uh, it's a great gift for people. Once you've read it, give it to someone else or keep it on your bookshelf for a, a reference. Uh, Rick, uh, Richard, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks to all of you who have been listening and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at our next program. And for those of you who have already signed up for the program tonight through Arts and Letters Live, I look forward to joining you with that conversation with Daniel Silva, the author of The Order. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.